Today's scripture reading is taken from Luke 18, verses 18 to 30, and it can be found in the Pew Bibles on page 742. And a ruler asked him, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Honor your father and mother. And he said, all these things I have kept from my youth. When Jesus heard this, he said to him, one thing you still lack. Sell all you have and distribute to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come, follow me. But when he heard these things, he became very sad, for he was extremely rich. Jesus, seeing that he had become sad, said, how difficult it is for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. For it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. Those who heard it said, then who can be saved? But he said, what is impossible with man is possible with God. And Peter said, see, we have left our homes and followed you. And he said to them, truly I say to you, there is no one who has left house or wife or brothers or parents or children for the sake of the kingdom of God, who will not receive many times more in this time and in the age to, to come eternal life. God bless the reading of God's word. So we're continuing our series in Luke as we head to Easter Sunday. Um, this passage again is striking very Luke, Lucan, if you want to say that with the themes that Luke addresses. But it does make me think of what some, I heard somebody say this. They said delayed gratification is the key to a productive life. Delaying your wants and desires in order to be effective and productive. And I actually think one of my main jobs in parenting is teaching this very thing. No, you cannot have ice cream for lunch. No, we are not going to Florida tomorrow. No, you cannot have an iPhone. No, you cannot watch TV all day, right? No, no, no. Do you see there's a, a movie out on Netflix just came out a week ago. It's called Yes Day. Evidently, there's a day where whatever kids ask, the parents always say yes. Can you imagine that? Yes Day. Of course, the kids were aware of this movie, and they want to watch it, and of course, what I am saying, I am saying no. <laughs> no to yes day. I mean, I can't imagine if I said yes on yes day, if that was tomorrow, I'd find myself in Florida eating ice cream for lunch while they're playing on their iPhones. <laughs> Very quickly. And that's just in the morning. Who knows what I would have to say yes to. The question for us is, do we say yes to our desires? Anything that happens that we want, are we saying yes? The key is to realize we say yes to something, we're not saying yes to something else. So I think we need to be aware of the things that we're saying yes to that keeps us from saying yes to Jesus. Because there might be things in our life that we are so used to having and saying yes to, but we may not be aware of how, how that keeps us from saying yes to Jesus. And for us, it might be similar to this rich young ruler where it comes down to one thing, the one dominant thing that has us, if you want to put it that way, that keeps us from saying yes to Jesus, keeps us from experiencing the fullness of life that Jesus has promised. So when we look at this passage, we realize we need to learn to say yes to Jesus and no to everything else that attempts to rule and run your life. Now let's look at this passage briefly. It's a passage that also is in two other Gospels. It's a very popular 
uh, narrative story about this rich young ruler. I'm calling him rich young ruler. That's how he's identified elsewhere. But in this passage, it's clear that he was extremely rich. He's young, probably in his late teens. But at that point in that society in the ancient world, he's, a, he's an adult with responsibilities. And evidently, he's wealthy, but he's not necessarily a leader in the church or any religious way. He's a, probably a civic leader. Uh, but he asked a very important question. What must I do to inherit eternal life? He's concerned in thinking about eternal life, but he's thinking he needs to do something to get it. Like he's been good all along, and if he could just find what he needs to do to make sure his eternity, eternal state is sealed as far as his spiritual destiny, what must I do, he says. He also refers to Jesus as a good teacher. Now, Jesus is often referred to as teacher, but you, you don't see somebody saying, good teacher, what must I do? It's a little bit of a flattery, like, oh, I notice you're good, and I'm a rich, wealthy man, and I'm good, good teacher. Sort of being, getting on his good side. He flatters Jesus. He sees himself as good as well. He wants to know what he needs to do to attain uh, eternal life. But Jesus makes this comment that at, on the surface is kind of troubling, right? He says, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. On the surface, it appears Jesus is saying he's not good and only God in heaven is good, so why are you calling me good when I don't deserve that title? That's possible if you just look at that one verse and don't understand the context at all or understand Jesus, but that interpretation just does not work when we dig deeper into understanding what Jesus is saying. It's kind of saying, I don't think you know who you might be talking to, and I don't think you realize what the term good means. Because he's saying only God is good. It's highlighting the fact that this man who thinks he's good and Jesus probably sees into him, realizing that he's probably of some need that he doesn't understand, he doesn't get. And that's what we'll find out because that's clearly the case. But it's also the sense that when applied to other people, good is subjective. When applied to God, it is absolute. God is good. He doesn't change. He is always good. John Calvin says this, you falsely call me a good master unless you acknowledge that I have come from God. In other words, before you use the word good, you better think what the implications are, especially for you. In other words, he is right. He is the good teacher, but he's the only good teacher. He's God in the flesh. And that makes a difference for this rich young ruler, but he doesn't realize it. Goodness is not based on mere deeds. Goodness for God is who he is and always is. That's why sometimes you'll hear people say Jesus was a good moral teacher. Yes, he was, but it's much more than that. Goodness in a way that people may not understand when they apply that to God himself. Good is a relative term, except applied to God. So Jesus then gets to the point of certain commandments and asks them if he's followed them. Five out of the Ten Commandments. Uh, do, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not murder, do not lie, honor your parents. He names five of the Ten Commandments, and the guy's like, okay, good, I've kept those. He feels good. I mean, I haven't committed adultery, haven't killed anybody, haven't stolen anything, haven't lied, have honored my parents. I am in good shape, but I don't think he understands the law in which, in the way that Jesus sees it, particularly when we look at Matthew in the Sermon on the Mount. He's looking at it as a surface level, feeling really good about himself, kind of like the Pharisee and the tax collector. Before this passage, you have a little scene with a Pharisee and a tax collector going to the temple to pray. The Pharisee goes into the temple and prays, and he says, Thank you, Lord, that I'm not like other people, like the tax collector back there. I fast twice a week, and I give what is required. Basically, he's kind of saying, Lord, aren't you glad that I'm on your team, <laughs> that I'm such a good person? I don't know how that's prayer, but that's what the Pharisee's thinking, that he's so good. Tax collector stands far off, 
doesn't look up. He's not comparing himself to other people. But he says, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. God, have mercy on me, a sinner. If you want to memorize a prayer, that's a prayer to memorize. God, have mercy on me, a sinner, clearly in need. Clearly, you have not kept to what God has desired because God is holy and we are not. God, have mercy on me. But when you look at the Ten Commandments, again, there's this surface level of keeping them, but I don't think the guy sees, the ruler sees how he has probably broken them. You know, there's this wonderful uh, series of movies called The Decalogue uh, by a Polish filmmaker uh, in the 1980s. Uh, you know, not the easiest to watch if you're not used to subtitles and trying to find a slow narrative. But each of the film films addresses one of the commandments. It's brilliant the way it's written, the way it's done. And I decided to watch them without knowing what commandment that he was supposed to be addressing in a given film. What was striking to me is you often did not know. Because what you have is when you're breaking one commandment, you're breaking other commandments. And it's the human condition and life situation in which you're breaking commandments that you may not realize you're breaking. And that's why Jesus says, you know, some say do not murder, but I say do not be angry, right? Anger is just as much of a sin as murder in the sense that you're going against God's law. Or even a lack of generosity is commanded instead of stealing. Ephesians 4.28, let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor doing honest work with his own hands so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. So this guy may not have stolen anything, but in what sense is he not living up to the law in the larger sense by, by being generous? So this guy says, look, I've kept it all. I've done what I've had to do. And then Jesus comes. I'm like, really, Jesus? Like, you know, you look at this passage. He says, one thing you lack, sell all you have, distribute to the poor. Come on. Seriously? Seriously. Think about that. Sell everything. What is Jesus doing here? How can he say such a thing? You know, and I would say, in another passage in Mark, Jesus is not trying to trap him, trick him, or make him feel sad, right? And that's what he does, but he's... It says in Mark, he looked at him and loved him, knowing this particular guy, this is what he needed. Think about it. He said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus is thinking, I know what you must do is get rid of the thing that has a complete grip on your life. And see, this is following the Ten Commandments. Think about this. The five commandments he gave... Do not, uh, do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, bear false witness, honor your father and mother. There's another five. Think of what the other five are. No other gods. Don't take his name, the Lord's name in vain. No idols. Keep the Sabbath. And you shall not covet. I think Jesus, in one request, lumps all those five commandments in one request. And see, the man can't do it. He can't do it because it reveals who his master really is. See, there's others who have followed and committed to the Lord. In the disciples, Jesus says, come follow me, I'll make you fishers at men's. At once, they left their nets and followed him. At once, left their business, left their family, went, who knows where they were going? Who knows where this guy is going to lead them? But they went, they trusted in Jesus. Just to let you know, giving all the merit, his salvation is not merited by what he gives up. His giving, his not giving up reveals what's ruling him. And trusting the Lord, trusting in his goodness. That's why also in this passage in Luke 18, before this, children are coming up to Jesus. And the disciples, no, no, get these children out of the way. And Jesus says... Let them come to me, because such belongs the kingdom of God. 
childlike dependence and trust in Jesus is what he's looking for. Even later in this passage, a blind beggar wanting to see. Jesus opens his eyes so that he can see. I think it's an image of not only physical sight, but spiritual sight. But this rich young ruler doesn't see. And it's, this is the most ironic verse, I think, in the New Testament. He became very sad, for he was extremely rich. Really? Think about that. He became very sad because he was extremely rich. He's sad because the stuff that he has is keeping him from Jesus, and he, he wants eternal life. He wants to know or follow Jesus in a certain sense, but unfortunately, his sadness is not strong enough to overcome that. His possessions has a hold on him. In Matthew, in uh, another teaching of Jesus, the worries of this life, the deceitness of wealth, and desires for other things come and choke the word. You think you cannot live without it is what is going on. But you're miserable with it because you know you can't have the Lord. This is why the lover of our souls, the prince of peace, the one that knows you and loves you is relentless in dealing with anything that gets in the way for you to know his goodness and love. And there's certain things that we value more than his goodness and love. What it comes down to, we want God on our terms, not his terms. And I think what, what I struggle with is I really don't believe he's good. That's what it comes down to. Do I really believe God is good? Do I really believe he's for me? That I could follow and obey whatever he says. He is so good. Romans 8, 32. He did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. How will he not also with him graciously give us all things he's so merciful he's so gracious Matthew 7 comparing parenting to him if you then who are evil meaning parents know how to give good gifts to your children how much more will your father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him I mean evil meaning sinful not that parents are all evil <laughs> The sense that he is perfect, that he is good. And parents, though we try to do our best, don't always do our best, but want good things for our kids, how much more does your heavenly father want to give you good things? And even when life is difficult, even when you've made poor choices, even when things and circumstances are aligned such that God is not working for you in a certain way, but as you pray and as you seek counsel, you realize you're under a certain discipline from the Lord who's withholding as a good parent would, says in Hebrews 12, for they discipline us for a short time as it seemed best to them, our parents, but he, the Lord, disciplines us for our good that we may share in his holiness. He is so good and so good to us. And so I think it's, again, ironic. He calls him good teacher but he doesn't want to receive or trust in his goodness because his trust is elsewhere. Then Jesus goes on and talks about the difficulty of having so much stuff and entering the kingdom of heaven. The camel through an eye of a needle. I don't know if you ever heard about the archway and the camel taking all the stuff off the camel's back to go through the eye of the needle, which is the archway into the city. Well, that's not the case here. You might have heard that, but what he's really saying is take the largest animal you know of in Palestine and the smallest possible item you might encounter, which is the eye of a needle, and see if that camel can go through. It's impossible. It doesn't happen. Disciples are really shocked by this because in many ways they thought wealth was a guarantee of God's blessing. But I think Jesus is saying not only the rich man, but anybody to be saved, it's by God's work. Human effort is futile. What must I do to inherit eternal life? He wants to do something to earn it, to get it. Like the Pharisee in the temple, thankfully, thanking God for how righteous he is. Entrance into the kingdom of God is like a child being helpless. We need to say, Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. Lord, change my heart. And right now, I imagine, there, I know there's things in my life, and I imagine there's things in your life that maybe have, a little bit of hold on you that, that might keep you from having the kind of spiritual life 
and understanding God's love for you, you, something might be in there that's a barrier. And I believe God can break whatever that is in your life because he loves you. He loves us. And he is merciful. And you see this examples in people's lives who have broke, God has broken into and made some very uh, willing to obey the Lord. And matter of fact, because this is dealing with finances and Luke seems to address this often, when I was on staff with a campus ministry, I had to raise my support. And there was a story around us campus staff workers that we would talk about and somebody mentioned as an example for all of us to be generous, there was one guy who had a house and the cars that he needed, had a simple but you know, modest home, had a business, but all of a sudden it skyrocketed. Skyrocketed. It, he was making millions. I don't know how much, but a lot of money. Um, he decided to continue to live on the same income that he was living before this happened. So it got to a point where he was giving away 90% of what he had, 90%. Everybody was really impressed with his godliness. I just wanted his phone number. No. (laughs) Raising support. I don't know who this guy is. But there's other ways. You know, I don't know what it is for you. Here it's, it's talking about finances, but it could be anything. It could be anything that has a grip on you, your your identity based on what you do, your career, your success. Even your family, which Jesus gets into, as good as that is in a subjective sense, because G- Peter says, look, we've left everything. And Jesus comments, and he says, whoever has left house, wife, brothers, parents, or children for the sake of the kingdom will not receive many times more. What is he saying there? What do you mean leaving your family? leaving your wife, leaving your... This is crazy talk. I do think he's saying, not prizing that as your central focus in your life. The normal life of familial closeness and making sure you're never facing any kind of persecution because of your beliefs, having a nice, comfortable, perfect life, and if God ever calls you to do something that that shifts that around, you're going to say no because you have your nice, perfect life comfortable life you're not going to risk that and this is where it comes into question in the end what what's your master do you pursue his kingdom first this is what paul said i consider everything a loss because of surpassness surpassing worth of knowing christ jesus my lord for whose sake i've lost all things i consider them rubbish that i may gain christ Now, it doesn't mean giving away everything you have. But it means where your heart is, where your heart, uh, what your heart is set on. And and for a lot of us, it's not going to be this big, grand gesture. It's actually going to be the next step of deciding to follow Christ. That might be a little bit riskier, that might shift a little bit of your daily and weekly habits, or might shift a little bit in your relationships. But Jesus promises you will not, how will you will receive many times more over in this time and the age to come, following Christ. By the way, it's not about eternal life and what you get in the end. It's about following Christ now and getting fully in eternity. Andrew Murray says, if there's anything holding you back or any sacrifice you're afraid of making, come to God and prove how gracious your God is. Never be afraid that he will command from you what he will not bestow. Do you see that? Don't be afraid. Oh, Lord, don't call me to be a missionary. I really don't want to be a missionary. You know, he's going to enable you to do that if that's what he's calling you to do. And sometimes there is a wrestling. But there is a sense of, for all Christians, just to surrender. Jonathan Edwards put it this, puts it this way. I've given myself all that I am and have to God so that I am not in any respect my own. That's what happens when you become a Christian. Some have attempted Christianity and abandoned it because it was too difficult. I don't believe, as I've heard it said, 
No one has ever gone through the crisis of deliberately following Jesus and making him Lord and found him to be a failure. Just doesn't happen. He is good. He is to be trusted. He went to the cross for us. He sends us his spirit. He doesn't ask us to do something that he's not going to empower us to do. Nancy DeMoss says, to surrender to the creator's control is not burdensome. It is the place of blessing, fullness, and peace. I believe that's true, and I believe all of us, including me, as I've been wrestling with God in the last week or so, there's probably things that uh, need to take a step in doing and leave other things behind. Some call to serve others, love others, whatever it would be. You want to do that understanding the Lord is on the other side, that there's peace and fullness and grace. But I do think there's certain things that, that have a grip, can have a grip on us. And I think it becomes from our own nature of, of how we are wired, thinking that we are entitled to our life. We are entitled to what we have. You know, there's another, <laughs> I know I quote songs, there's a song by Mumford and Sons, but he, he talks about a darkness dominating everything he seeks. Really interesting lyrics, because then he goes, stars hide your fires, these are my desires, I won't give them up to you this time around. So I have been found with my stake stuck in this ground, marking the territory of this newly impassioned soul. What he's saying, stars hide your fires, actually comes from Macbeth, I had to look this up, that is what the, the guy is talking about. Macbeth is ready to do an act, he's ready to commit murder, doesn't want his mind changed, so he wants the stars not to see him. The Lord sees everything we think, we say, and do. And this is the end of the song of striking. You've gone too far this time, you have there not a reason nor rhyme which to take this soul that is so rightfully mine. This is my life, I get to do what I want to do. Your life is not yours. It's the Lord's. He created you. He made you. He loves you. And the best way for you to live is to turn and trust in his goodness and love. Whatever that means. I'm yours, Lord. Everything I've got. Everything I'm not. I'm yours, Lord. Try me out and see. See if I can be completely yours. What's the next step for you? Again, it's not giving away everything. The Lord is good and gracious and merciful. He'll only ask the next thing that we are to do. Because he loves us. Do you trust that he is good? Do you believe he's good? Helen Rosevere said, I need to be so utterly God's that he can use me or hide me as he chooses, as an arrow in his hand or in his quiver. I will ask no question. I relinquish all rights to him who desires my supreme good. He knows best. The amazing thing is, as we take the small step to surrender to him, he might use us in ways we would never imagine to bless and encourage others. And as we do that, we take that step and we experience his goodness and his grace. He's such a good, good father. And you are loved by him. And that's who you are. Do you believe that? Do you believe that? Just like the children's message, he is the good shepherd. The good shepherd in the way that no other shepherds are good. He has your best in mind. Surrender to him and you'll discover the wonder and joy of his goodness. Let's pray. Father, pray that you would help us to see your goodness and grace. Lord, help us to gaze upon who you are. Holy Spirit, come. Speak to our hearts. Lord, I pray that you would comfort those who are distracted and disturbed and have difficulty. And I pray for us and myself that might be a little too comfortable. Pray that you will help us to 
to respond to the call to follow you, whatever that is you're asking. Pray that we would seek you with all of our hearts. We desire to know you and follow you fully and not just go through the motions. Thank you for your mercy and grace. In Jesus' name, amen.